Um, I'm a member of uh, Ground Zero and Lake Forest Park for Peace. And although I'm, I'll be speaking about, uh, actually I'm, I'll be speaking some about nuclear weapons and the dangers of nuclear weapons, but uh, if we get there, there's three lawsuits that I would be talking about. But I'd like to say right up front that uh, I believe in nonviolent direct action and public demonstrations. And I believe that this is the road to change, that Gandhian nonviolence is the way that will save us. And that these lawsuits are a form and an extension of that philosophy of speaking truth to power. A couple of basic things that I think I have to say is the Trident submarine base is 20 miles from here. Most people know that, um, or most people here. Actually, very few people know that, but probably most people here do. Uh, about a quarter of the nuclear weapons that are actively deployed by the United States are uh, deployed there, and there's perhaps like a thousand nuclear warheads there. The second lawsuit, if and, and it depends on what folks want to talk about. Uh, Indian Island is across from Port Townsend, and that's uh, I measured it on the maps, about 37 miles away. There's no nuclear weapons. Uh, as far as I know, at Indian Island, they probably have depleted uranium munitions stored there. Um, oh, so, and I'll say this, so, I mean, I, I thank Gene Buskin for figuring out what we're talking about. And this is probably, she's probably become clairvoyant from years of doing the calendar, is my guess. But, but I didn't really tell you a lot about this, but I'll tell you this much on nuclear weapons in our community that uh, th it is dangerous. Uh, right now, uh, there's unmarked nuclear warhead shipments that go down I-5 periodically for the life extension program, for the W-76 warhead at Bangor. Um, they still ship uh, rocket motor shipments by rail. Um, but the biggest threat, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the dangers of nuclear weapons. The biggest threat is the missile handling at Bangor uh, it's a low probability of an accident, but the, the result would be catastrophic. Um, and it comes from the fact that one Trident missile, and I don't know if people have seen the Ground Zero missile that Rodney Brunel so uh, carefully carries around the countryside, is 44 feet long, six and a half feet in diameter, and weighs 130,000 pounds. But because it's um, the propellant is more volatile than TNT. It's actually equal to 155,000 pounds of TNT in the propellant. And if the missile is dropped, it can de detonate. And of course, uh, the missiles at Bangor have nuclear warheads on top of them that would spread plutonium. And the submarine is even, uh, if it carries, uh, 24 missiles, it would be equal to 3.7 million pounds of TNT. The map there shows uh, the arc is around the explosive handling wharf, and the largest arc is, according to explosive safety um, regulations, no house can be built within that outer ring. And that's because the fact that if an accident occurs at Bangor, it would be equal to over 3 million pounds of TNT blowing up. In addition, I might as well say this uh, in addition, and this is really strange to me, that no one knows about this. Um, there's what's called EPZ zones, or they're called emergency protective zones that are around the base. And I got this information last year from uh, the Kitsap County Department of Emergen Emergency Management. And these are areas that if there's an accident at the base, uh, th these are areas where the, they expect a radiological release and people are expected to either, well, first off, if you live in that area, you're supposed to tune into the radio and they'll tell you whether to shelter in place, which means you know, close the blinds, keep your door shut, or evacuate. Problem is, nobody knows this. I mean, that's what's, and that's what's so weird about all, all this whole issue. 
I, I did a public records request to the elementary school. The, there's two elementary schools in these zones, and I did one to Central Kitsap School District, asking if they had any information about an EPZ zone uh, or emergency uh, response for the base, and they had nothing. They had nothing. So that's, um, that, that's the danger. Um, if we talk about it, there's three lawsuits that Ground Zero did a lawsuit that went from June 2001 to September 2004 to try and stop the D-5 missile. And the thing that was really, I thought, great about that is that we made a, a not only did we have a lawsuit, and not only was our lawsuit very good, we were trying to get the Navy to do an EIS on upgrading to the larger missile. And we were, our argument was explosives, was one of the issue, main issues. Uh, we should have won it. And the fact that they're doing an EIS now kind of shows that we should have, should have won it. Um, we, uh, we went to the Ninth Circuit and lost in sep September 2004. Um, and then the second lawsuit, uh, I was involved in a Supreme Court case, which is similar. It's involving explosives. I did a, a, a uh, FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request to the Navy for information at the ammunition depot at Port Townsend for exactly the same information. But the Navy had decided at that time not to release it. Um, now, I, there's numerous reasons probably why they did, but it's, it's, the information's embarrassing. It ended up going to the Supreme Court, uh, the, and it was actually wasn't finished until, I made the FOIA request in December 2003, and it went to the Supreme Court and actually just finished last summer in July. And actually that's one of the reasons, you know, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, I finally wrote up the summary of what happened during that time period. And um, it, uh, I have to, actually I have to present it to the people of Port Townsend who actually did a lot of work uh, the mayor of, of Port Townsend, the city council, Jefferson County commissioners, a lot of people helped me and were supportive. And then the last is, the, is there's a current lawsuit that st started in uh, June 2012. We're trying to stop the second wharf. So I had done, what I've been doing uh, also is trying to figure out, you know, what to, actually what to say to you, to you folks <laughs> about these three lawsuits and about Navy activities. Um, all three involved Navy explosives in the form of rocket propellant or conventional explosives, and all of them involved the Freedom of Information Act. Um, but the unifying issue, and I'll just read this, what I think is that what's important, is public opinion is extremely important to governmental agencies, and it's like way more important, I think, than we realize. They will go to extreme lengths to control the release of information. And I'm here, I'm talking about the Navy, but I think it applies to many governmental agencies. They'll go to great lengths to con control the release of the information. And then if the information is released, that may seem damaging. Um, they'll go to great lengths to try and control it. And in the case of the Navy, there's, there's no question I don't think that public opinion is more important to them than public safety. And that's, that's the reason, and that's the reason why this, no one knows about this map. It's like they actually came up with an uh, emergency plan, but it's so embarrassing to them, they, they won't tell the public about it. That if the public knew what kind of threat was at the base, uh, they might be upset. And it, they'd have, the Navy would have something else to deal with. Um, so because of this, regarding the issues of nuclear weapons and other types of, of military equipment like this, um, the, I would say, and I've said, actually I've realized this for a while, the greater the danger to the public, the less likely the public will ever be told about that danger. And there's been accidents at Bangor that no one's found out about, and who knows what types of things have happened there that no one is, knows about. 
In 2003, I'll just talk briefly for a few more minutes, uh, give, give a couple examples, and we'll, we'll see what people want to talk about. Um, in November 2003, a missile handling, handling crew at Bangor was hoisting a missile out of the submarine. And this is a, the smaller missile. This is, I forget the, the size of this. It's like 70,000 pounds, 73,000 pound missile. It's the Trident One out of a su submarine. And they put a shroud over the top of the submarine, submarine and then a winch on top of it. And they crank the, the missile up. Well, in this case, they got it all set up to crank it up, and then they went on coffee break. And then they came back, and they had forgotten. They left a ladder inside the shroud, and they winched the missile right into the ladder. And the ladder busted the nose cone and was within inches of nuclear warheads, of live, live nuclear warheads. Um, and this was November 7th. 2003, but it, the thing is, it didn't come out until March 2004. No one knew about it, and the only reason why they did, because the Navy was going to court-martial the sailors involved that were working on the pier, and so they, I assume, they leaked the information out. What happened was the top three commanders of Swift Pack were were let go as a result of that. Um, the director of the Kitsap County. Uh, Department of Emergency Management, who's, who also gave me, here we back, back to this PowerPoint. The person who gave me this information on these EPCs said, um, she was quoted in the paper that uh, she didn't know anything about it. And she said something like, if it was serious, she figures the Navy would have told her. So, and that's the attitude, you know, and that's, that's the danger, I, I think. Um, is that dangers do exist, um, and the greater the danger, of course, the less we're going to know about it. Um, for the second explosive handling war, if the Navy made, create a 71-page record called a business case analysis, and the first 50 pages basically went over the need for the wharf and what kind of things they'd have to do if they didn't have it, um, but then there were 10 pages that talked about the risk of, of building or not building the wharf, and they, they talked about public relations. They said on environmental issues, they thought there was a moderate, moderate, moderate risk that an expensive environment, environmental lawsuit will occur that will delay the project but not result in design changes. And they also said there's a likelihood of a lawsuit occurring. And they mentioned the previous one that Ground Zero had. Under public relations, they said there's a moderate risk of that public perception of Navy's commitment to safety will require significant damage control. So they knew that there was a risk that information would be come out of this EIS, even though they weren't releasing it, that would cause them problems. They said, and here's another quote, the likely, likelihood of a public relations event occurring most likely initiated by anti-nuclear organizations in Silverdale area. Um, so that's it. I mean, um, we can talk about uh, the different, whatever folks want to talk about. I don't know. I, I think I was informed I was supposed to talk 20 minutes and then open it up. Is that right? Did I do right? Okay. Yeah. I, I'm sure you said it, but I didn't quite understand it. Please explain what the inside circle means and what the outside circle means. Yeah, the inside circle is, it's, uh, ex these are called uh, explosive safety quantity distance arcs. And basically what it means is the larger the explosives, the bigger the explosion, and so therefore the bigger the arc to protect things. And they have different levels of safety that they're trying to protect. The larger arc is, is, that you, is to prevent houses from being built within a space. Now, actually, I didn't mention the smaller one. The smaller arc is for public transportation, and you're not supposed to have any public transportation routes within that circle. But they don't tell anybody. People go, you know, that's right in the middle of Hood Canal, and, and they don't tell anyone about that either. I mean, that's, that's, 
Uh, so was there, was that it? <laughs> okay, uh, well, are there any houses in that outer circle? No, uh, there isn't. It goes, it goes, the arcs go right up to the property line. Um, the odd thing about it is um, at Kings Bay, Georgia, a missile is considered um, 200,000 pounds of TNT. And for some reason, it's 155,000 pounds here. And I don't know whether that's to make it fit inside the space that they have or not. What they say is they're allowing for a growth missile, a bigger missile. But actually, I did a lot of research on, on what the propellant is equal to in terms of TNT. And there's some people say, there were some studies that said it's, it's even more than 200,000 pounds. Um, you know, with the second wharf there, they're, they're building a, so if this isn't bad enough, this is one wharf. The next wharf is only a few hundred feet away from this one. And they're actually going to have loading and unloading of missiles at both wharfs at the same time. And what can happen, and no, you know, they haven't really talked about it, but, um, I mean, this is what the Department of Defense Explosive Safety Board uh, would not, never would grant didn't, what we found out in the lawsuit is they weren't granted a permit for this project um, because the De Department of Defense Explosive Safety Board, whose job is to oversee um, this, you know, expl explosives in, in military installations, uh, they wanted them to prove that an explosion at one wharf wouldn't cause an explosion at the other wharf before they gave it a permit. That was, there was actually a couple of different things. But they, they couldn't, and, and the answer is, is it would. You'd have 7.4 million pounds of TNT possibly detonating at once in the case of an accident. So that goes beyond, the, so there you're into, you're into residential areas at that point. And, and probably with the second, you know, I, I actually have drawn some of these things, and I've drawn uh, different maps, and I have a map that I've made of one that shows the 7.4 million pounds of explosives and uh, that's it's probably what it's probably what they should be addressing um, yeah on the uh, on any planning like transit wants to build within the circle there and not to do it then even though the public is not given the information they've got to be given some information why they cannot in that area. No. no, they don't say, that, no, they don't tell boats. You mean, you're talking about marine traffic? No. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the village of transit line. Yeah, he's asking about the transit um, and if they were to install a, a transit line, whether the Navy would, would tell them. Well, the property is all, the land property is, it belongs to the base. So, but, so it'd just be marine traffic and it's, there isn't, I mean, they should, yeah. You're, if they had a ferry or something through there, they should tell them. And it's possible the ferry would, could go around that space. It's, yeah. Um, you made the statement that they've, they've, um, they've moved nuclear warheads up and down I-5? Yeah. The public doesn't. How did you find out? Well, it's really, that's, I'm glad you asked that. The question was, how do you, uh, well, a couple of things. <laughs> well, here's the thing. A lot of this is really obvious. Um, there's a life extension program for the W76 warheads. It's, it's public information. They're going to do, uh, for the W88 warheads, the, the, the W76 are 100 kiloton. The W88 is 455 kilotons. They're, it's basically, you can call them Trident 1, the Trident 2 warheads. They also call them that. But it's public information. I mean, that's what all this infrastructure is for these different labs and things is for this type of work. And so the W76 is going right now to Pantex to be dismantled and then it goes to different locations. Some of it's upgraded, some of them, they might get new, they get new components, but it has to go there. And it's no surprise. I mean, it's no secret or anything like that. And, and that's, they say that's what the wharf is for, is for the, the life extension program for both the missile and for the warheads for the inc increased handling of it. 
What's, what's really interesting, what I wanted to say was, um, I did a lot of research on it, and I, I kind of, what I try and do, personally, I think it's, it's really useful if a reporter reports something. I mean, I can write something, but I think if it shows up in the newspaper and a reporter does some work on it, it, it looks, people consider it. And so I helped this one reporter for the Kitsap Sun, a great guy, I like him. And um, he did a story on this, on, there's a story about a year and a half ago on warhead shipments from here to Pantex. And I think he, he even kind of figured out how many shipments there might be, and we were trying to figure that out. Um, but interestingly enough, no one believed him. I mean, no, I don't think anybody believed him. None of the, you know, like there might have been 60 bloggers come in on it, and they all thought he was nuts. That no, no one would be shipping nuclear warheads at this point. But of course, they are. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm involved in this issue is so that people can see that this is very, very active. This is, a, this is you know, the, the work at the base is very active all the time. They're constantly upgrading, constantly upgrading buildings. Um, there's a lot of things coming up that they want to put in Hood Canal. Um, but anyway, that's the way, I think, um, I think though I did, I might have got a record that showed, I mean, that was always my goal at the time, you know, a few years ago, I was trying to get records showing warhead shipments. And I did get something from the DOE. Years ago, I got something that would show these transits, and it, it wouldn't tell you how many warheads or anything like that, but you could tell there was warhead shipments. And I got something similar to that, again, that, that proved it. But you don't need it. You don't need that kind of information to know that that's taking place. They can't fly them. Um, they don't take them by train. Um, they don't take them by boat, so they take them right down I-5 and unmarked trucks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, these warheads you're speaking of, are they nuclear warheads? And my second question was, this explosion of submarine missile rocket motors, uh, oh, that was a derailment in 1986. Uh, where was that? Where was it? Yes, yeah, so you discovered rail cars carrying submarine missile rocket motors. Yeah, so the question was about this accident in 1986. Um, Ground Zero was doing a demonstration, and we were going to sit on the railroad tracks when the, at, at Bangor. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so the train was coming into the base with rocket motors. They're basically, rocket motor is just a stage of a missile. So there's like one first, second, third stage rocket motors, and they're, they, they have the propellant in them. They're a solid propellant that's in it. We were waiting, uh, and actually there was pretty good media coverage at the time in 86 for this um, and we were going to block sit on the tracks when the train came in but what happened instead is it derailed in Chehalis outside of Chehalis. Oh wait a minute is that anyone near Bangor? Or sh no it's oh. it's it's kind of near Olympia or something. I think. Oh okay. Yeah. yeah in route yeah. in route but the Navy said over and over that there's nothing explosive on the, on the train, but it, even though it said Class A explosives on the side of the cars. Um, and this one reporter, that's where I, that was my first FOIA request, actually. Um, I like it. So, so because you asked the question, I'm going to tell you. Because I like this story. This is my first FOIA request that I made. I figured out, I got an, a book from the ACLU and figured it out, sent it to the Navy. It took me a year to get it. And so when I got it, I, uh, Wetzel was the ombudsman for the Seattle Times. I think that was his name. And I said to him, you know, no big deal, but I got some records from the Navy, you know, that story you had a year ago where you said there's no explosives. There actually was. Um, and he said, well, send it to me. And then the reporter called me a couple days later, and he was really irritated because he said he had asked the Navy numerous times about the explosives, and he had seen the Class A explosives placard on the cars as well. And so then, then a couple days later, a front page story on the Seattle Times that said Navy lied about train shipment, you know, to Bangor. And it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And that was my first, first FOIA request. Thank you. And then these uh, warheads you're speaking of, are they nuclear? 
Yeah, the nuclear war, yeah, the ones going to Pantex on the trucks are, are nuclear. Um, the, your PowerPoint, this is not nuclear. These, are, this is the, these circles are the result of conventional explosion, explosive material in the missile, in the rocket motors. However, when this, if a submarine blew up, it, you'd have 80 nuclear warheads. Plutonium from that would be in it. That's not considered in this. It is considered in the EPZs that no one knows about. The EPZs? I, got, I did a public records request to the Kitsap County. Uh, the destination of these warheads that are going down by fire? Uh, Texas. Pantex. The Pantex plant in Texas? And they, that's where they disassemble them. They can't take them apart at, at Bangor. Why not? Uh, they, don't, they don't have that capability. Um, they're sealed. Yeah. Don't they go both ways? Yeah, oh yeah, they go both ways. Yeah, the ones going down there are, are what, 20 years old or so. So on top of that, so they're aging old warheads going down there. They get rebuilt and they come back again. So, you know, there was a lot of discussion in the 70s and there was in the EIS in the 70s about the warheads coming in. And Magnuson wanted to make sure that they were brought in a certain way and that the trains that were carrying rocket motors were going at a certain speed. But now we have, years later, the old ones going down and then new ones coming back, just as many, and no one knows about it. And I'm afraid to say probably no one in the state wants to know about it. Um, I, you know, back then when we, anytime I've talked to anyone with the state about it, they, they don't know anything about it and they don't seem to want to. I have in my hand, a little blurb from the Seattle Times, January 15th, that says that a judge in Tacoma refused to issue a preliminary injunction blocking the construction of um, the new war. So um, what impact does this have on a lawsuit if construction and a potential EIS if the war is already partially built? I'm not sure. Um, normally, like in a lawsuit, like, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I'm actually an unemployed electrician. Is the way I present myself. Um, but the way the lawsuit works um, for a NEPA lawsuit, you ask, you, you have your arguments and you, your regular motion for summary judgment, which we haven't even gotten into yet. We move for preliminary injunction, and the judge rules on that if you have if the judge feels you have an argument that is overwhelming, that will succeed in later arguments, then they'll issue the injunction. He didn't, in this case, he didn't really seem to want to listen to us. Um, uh, you know, the, the construction started this fall, and actually there's another leaflet out there that says when it started. I don't know if it was September or something it started or later. It's a four-year project, and they've got maybe six months of it. They're into it maybe six months. Um, you know, um, as far as the law, I don't know, as, I guess while you bring it up, I mean, as far as the lawsuit itself, um, our arguments are, I'll say this at this point, I, our arguments are much better than I ever thought they'd be. Um, we've discovered that the Department of Defense Explosive Safety Board refused uh, to approve their project and that the Secretary of the Navy is going to take responsibility for safety from here on out for the rest of the life of the war if they're going to accept any, anything that happens, the Navy is going to accept it. We've discovered that, um, and this really hasn't come out, what they should have done in the EIS, there's a, there's a wharf next to the new one they want to build they should have torn out. And it's quite a large wharf. It's a, the new wharf is six acres, and the wharf they should have torn out is called the marginal wharf, and it's over two acres. And what we've, kind of, what we've discovered in some of these records that we got from the Navy is that they knew it. The Navy knew there were people in the Navy that were promoting that this wharf be removed uh, for, to improve the environment, but the, the Navy didn't 
didn't want to do that. Instead, what the Navy's done is they, what they have is an uh, in-lieu fee program, and they pay uh, $6.9 million, goes to the Hood Canal Coordinating Council, and they use it for projects, and I don't know, $7 million or something. A total of $15.7 million the Navy paid out to the Hood Canal Coordinating Council and to some of the tribes. Uh, some of the tribes received money. And with that passing of the money, with that money being spent, the Navy is no longer responsible for, for the environmental health of, of the project. Um, so, but I guess I didn't mean to leave you with that bummer, you know. But the, the, the important part is, is that we discovered that there was another th way they should have dealt with that. And we haven't, we've just begun to push it, really. We actually, I went to a Hook and Coordinating Council, last public one they had, and I told them that um, this should have happened, that it shouldn't be, it shouldn't, they shouldn't have gone to the in lieu fee uh, program. So, um, that, and there's other issues. I mean, I don't know. If you can follow, I don't know if you can follow this. The, the federal judge actually put a gag on. We have a gag order on the plaintiffs. And that's another issue that can actually backfire on the Navy. The Navy, when the Navy overreaches, and that's what happened in the Supreme Court case, the Navy overreached trying to protect records for Indian Island, and they ended up losing. Um, they ended up losing big. You know, they lost, a, they lost their FOIA exemption that they wanted to hang on to. Um, in this case, when they start, when federal judges start issuing gag orders on, like I have a box of records at home that I can't, I can't tell people what's in them. I got them from the Navy. Um, there's a Kitsap Sun <laughs> article written from these records, but I can't talk about them. And um, that's, that's in the Ninth Circuit. So that issue, the gag, or, the issue of the gag orders is, is in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and I don't know. I don't, I don't know how it will play out. I mean, lawsuits really are kind of like a, they're an experiment in truth. I mean, you really aren't really quite sure how they're going to turn out. Neither does the Navy. Neither does the, the Navy. And I hope the Navy, with this sequester issue, I hope that they will take a hard look at this wharf and decide it's not worth it. Uh, you know. Uh, so anyway, yeah. You talked about... Bangor. What about the uh, Georgia or the East Coast? Is the same thing happening there? Oh, they have two wharves there. They they built it with two wharves. Uh, it's funny that. Well, it's not funny, but the, here uh, the Navy says, "Well, they've got two wharves at uh, Kings Bay. We're just doing the same thing." But but the wharves are actually much further apart at Kings Bay than they will be at Bangor. Yeah. About the explosives, Glenn, why is, what, are those explosives being detonated uh, all, all over the place? Where, is, so they're, they're, they need to be, they've got, this, you're saying that the equivalent of 7.4 million pounds of TNT. So where are these explosives coming from and why, why such a huge volume? Well, that, that's, that's what's on a submarine. The, uh, the amount, I mean, it's only, there's only an explosion, of course, if there's an accident. Um, and the Navy has done what, you know, their fault tree analysis. It's really pretty antiquated way of looking at it. If, you know, a, an incident occurs, you know, what's the chance of that? I mean, I think the fault tree analysis is, is people are realizing, like with Fukushima and different things, there's so many different variables that can't be measured. But the reason why there's so much there uh, and why it's 3.7 million, that's, that's 155,000 pounds of TNT per missile times 24 missiles. And if one missile blows up on top of the submarine, it would blow up the whole submarine. That's, that's the problem. Yeah, two things. Um, one is um, that the cost is approximately three quarters of a billion to build this thing, right? Yeah. Seven hundred and fifteen million dollars. The wharf is seven hundred and fifteen million dollars. Yeah. And then the second thing, which um, 
I, I just have this vision in my head that when and if we get a bad earthquake, they're going to be handling it on two wharfs. And I cannot in any way expect that they can control what happens if we have a bad earthquake and if we have tsunamis. There was a tsunami in Tacoma once, it's in the USGS records, that caused an eight foot, I mean, there was an earthquake in, off Tacoma that caused an eight foot tsunami in Gig Harbor. This whole base is on the water. The seismic issue alone just completely, um, the, the chance that a seismic issue would cause an accident strikes me as um, a really scary thing. Yeah, this, this seismic issue is, is um, an important issue, and it was, it was in the EIS, but I don't know how they even address, you know, they, the way they address stuff in the EIS is uh, the likelihood, and um, they just blow it, wash it away. At the Pentex plant, they have alarms around the plant. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of, and I don't know if all nuclear, I don't know if nuclear power plants do this, but I mean, they could have alarms, they could have things around Banger to warn people if, if they should get away, because it's a, there's a lot of ha hazardous things there. The United States government, uh, in the form of the Army, uh, has uh, worked with the Washington State Emergency Network Services to publish a pamphlet to tell us what to do uh, the United States Army um, and it's United States Publishing. So you can contact for the uh, you can contact the United States. You can contact the Washington State Emergency Network Services uh, in Olympia for the eight and a half by eleven quite thick pamphlet uh, that will tell you what to do in case of a tsunami, for example, or smallpox and things like that. Well, I don't want to take over this meeting, but. I just, I went to a meeting of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. There were like hundreds of people there last week. And that's where I heard about the tsunami that happened in Tacoma that affected Gig Harbor. Um, but the amount of secrecy around all this stuff is insane. But you, you don't need a weatherman. I mean, you, you do not need any scientific information whatsoever to see the danger. It's in plain sight. That if you have explosives material enough to take a missile all the way to Russia, to, you know, to send it all the way up, you know, that's a lot of explosive power. You don't even have to know how much it is to know that if that goes off and it's right next to nuclear stuff and there, there isn't control because it's an earthquake, that this is a very dangerous situation. I don't need any scientific information whatsoever to assert that. In back there, I'd just like to say though, I did a FOIA request to FEMA and they didn't have any information on the, on the base, they the, nothing. nothing. They, they didn't, the FEMA didn't have any information on the sub-base. They, um, they won't, FEMA says it's not them, it's NRC. So, uh, so let's say that, you know, the worst case scenario happened, and one of these submarines blew up, you know, a uh, chain reaction happened, and uh, you know, all that plutonium got spread, spread around. What are we talking about here? It's not a chain reaction. Yeah, it's, if there was an accident, uh, there, I mean, this is, people are saying that it, uh, there wouldn't be a nuclear detonation, but there'd be plutonium spread. And I don't know, there's some, there have been some studies um, on this, but I could never figure out whether they were talking about one missile or they were talking about a whole submarine. Um, I mean, 3.7 million pounds of explosives is a small nuclear warhead. It's like a 1.8 kiloton bomb. Um, there was an explosion, um, uh, what's the one, in, in California in 1945. Um, that was a 4 million pounds of TNT. And there's people today who still think that was the first uh, nuclear explosion. Um, there's still people writing books about it. Uh, it was such a large, there's just small pieces 
of the two ships found, you know, like quarter size pieces. And so, where would all that plutonium go? Would it just destroy the entire area? I would, I would think so. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, like at Fukushima, it seems like they're trying to live there um, around that, the, some of those contaminated sites. Uh, and it depends on the, which way the wind goes. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I, I can't really say. I, you know, whether or not, whether or not we're all going to be in a trailer court in Montana and Idaho for the rest of our lives, I mean, I don't, I don't know what would happen. There was a rumor for years, I heard it up and on, that there was a smaller plutonium-powered rocket at some point, I think in the 80s, that exploded. Have you heard that? No, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what, what do you think are the most persuasive or the, most, the winning arguments of the lawsuit? Well, that they should have addressed explosive issues uh, as far as the EIS. I mean, in an environmental uh, study, um, you're, you know, they're supposed to uh, discuss, um, you know, if it's a catastrophic event that would happen, even though if it's a small probability, they're supposed to address that. Um, I think that's by far the strongest. And the fact that we found out that they never got approval uh, for, this, for the um, project is, is strong. Um, I mean, there's other ones, too. I mean, we argued, um, we argued that they didn't need it. Um, and we've argued now, of course, that they can't afford it. Um, I mean, this is, you know, well, this is 30 years uh, what, 1991 or something when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed and to be needing a second wharf now at Bangor is absurd. When the Navy came in in 2009 to do uh, the scoping, they were certain that it would be embraced by Kitsap County because of the jobs. And that's all they, they, they were smug about it. Um, I, I think they were smug about it. Um, that people, they'd win people over on jobs, and it, it just didn't work. Um, people, it just blew back at them. Why in the world do you need something like this? I think what's happening at Hookanal environmentally is, is tragic. It's an industrialization of, a, you know, a, a waterway that's um, in danger, and it's, it's in pretty good shape, um, and they don't, it should be stopped for the environmental reasons. So, two questions. Who was the Hood Canal working on? And would they, would they have any environmentalists in, the, in that group, or is there any potential for alliance with environmentalist groups? So, the Hood Canal, when we're recording, you know, what's their role? And, like, how, how do they? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, I'm not really up on on how they were formed. Hood Canal Coordinating Council. Question is, who who are they, um, and what are they doing? Maybe I guess it was. Um, they're an environmental group. Their their purpose is to protect Hood Canal. They have a board. It's, it's a strange group, you know, and, and maybe this is common. You know, they have a board, and the board is made up of uh, Mason County, uh, one or two Mason County commissioners. Well, the, the Mason County, uh, Jefferson County, and, and Kitsap County. And actually, Mason County was going to pull out of it last year because they were upset the way they were operating. They didn't feel they were operating openly. So they have... And, and actually, I, I'm not sure if the, there are some tribes are also on the board. I, I'm not totally sure. Maybe, maybe they are. Um, so they have a board uh, of largely public officials. And, and then they have their own, they have a president, 
uh, I think, and, and different. The organization itself uh, is, is kind of like a lot of nonprofits, looks like it anyway. And I think they, they mean to, to do well. Um, you know, I mean, let me just say up front, you know, when we, when we went to file this lawsuit, we went to a lot of environmental groups to try and get them to come on. I think a lot of them didn't really like the idea of taking on the Navy. The Sierra Club was really close to joining with us, but it was the national group who said no to the local group. Um, and so we didn't. It's, it's uh, PSR and Ground Zero um, ended up being the group. So I don't, I don't know if that speaks for an environmental groups in general, but I know a lot of ones that we came across, I think they were really reluctant to take on the Navy. Now, the Hood Canal Coordinating Council, um, you know, I've actually I've been to one meeting, and I plan on going, going to one next week again. I talked to them about the in-lieu fee program. And this is, a lot of this is, is uh, like the in-lieu fee program is encouraged by the state. The state likes it. The governor liked it. The governor was out there a year or two ago in a boat in the Hood Canal with the Navy and Hood Canal Coordinating Council talking about praising the in-lieu fee program. Now for them, I mean for, depending on how you look at it, you know, for Washington State, they can say, well, we can't fix everything, but we're getting a big chunk of money to fix something else. But you know, this really doesn't address the issue of whether you need it or not, or what the, what, and, and for, I mean, and, and for the Navy to pay $15 million for, out of a, what is that, a $715 million project, if all you have to do is pay $15 million to, to get rid of your problems, environmental problems, that's a very small price to pay. Um, the Hook Canal Coordinating Council, I don't know what they're doing right now. I like to think that they will start looking at this wharf that should be demolished. So, yeah. Yeah, Mary. Doesn't the Navy sit ex officio on the Canal Coordinating Council? Does the Navy sit on the council ex officio? Uh, yeah, they do. Um, it's, it's, uh, when I went to the Hook Canal Coordinating Council meeting, I gave them an email of discussion uh, with the, be, inside the Navy, different people talking back and forth, um, and this one woman said, this, is, this uh, marginal wharf should be demolished. It's the perfect project. It would be easy to do. It's cruddy. It was built in 1945, it's creosote piles. And then in the, the Navy's own EIS, they said this, it's because it's built close to the shoreline, uh, it prevents uh, salmon migration. It's, it's the worst structure out there. And when I went to the meeting, the woman who wrote that was there. She was sitting at the table with all of the hook. They had a, a horseshoe-shaped table arrangement, and she was sitting at the table with the rest of them. And I gave her, actually, I had a three-minute, you get three minutes, of course, to talk, you know, at these things. So I had my three-minute presentation, and I gave her a copy of it. And I, I talked to her for quite a while. I said, I hope I didn't get you in trouble. Because I gave them the, the email that had her name on it. She, she felt like she was just doing her job. And she, I mean, I, I actually have a lot of respect for her. She was trying to tell the Navy that this is, this is, this is the best approach. And, and of course, they don't, they don't want, you know, they don't want to answer to anybody. The Navy DeBrass doesn't want to answer to anybody. And they love the in-lieu fee. They love being able to buy off their problem. And they want that to be the standard. Yeah. So you mentioned a minute ago that the governor had been out with the Navy sure. a couple years ago. I'm assuming that was your bar. Yeah. Inslee on any of this. Uh, has anybody <laughs> had a conversation with him now that he's our new... Uh... Well, Inslee knows all about the base because that was his... The base is actually in, was Inslee's area. Um, and I've spoken over the years quite a bit with his staff. Um, I, don't, I don't know what he'll do. He... he he, he might, what will, what will he do on this? I, I don't know, I don't know. What really surprised you about, something that really surprised you about the Navy's behavior in this whole suit and 
and this whole expansion activity. If you have something that, a story or anything that's really surprised you, I'd like to hear. Second, first, the first uh, more short term question. Do you think if there was an engineer uh, up at the U, some of the people that uh, Mary Hansen has met, not, not necessarily earthquake people, but some engineer that could actually do a scenario of explosive options at that dock in some kind of situation, real situation, do you think that would help in relation to, you know, the, the, the county boards make a presentation? Do you think that would make a difference in terms of visibility for some of the options and some of the issues that uh, might be coming along with the expansion of the explosive dock? Yeah, uh, would it make a difference if, if someone from the University of Washington, news, yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Would it make a difference in terms of how people thought about it? Yeah, it would. Okay. Um, you know, it's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult. I mean, for something like that, it might be possible. It's difficult to get. Uh, we, we, our lawsuit does not address biological issues because it's so hard to, it's expensive, and it's difficult to find people. And so many people around here work with the Navy. Um, so they get their grants from the Navy. And it's hard to find uh, people that will testify with you. Um, there was a guy, I, I don't know if anyone knows Norm Buskey. Yes. Uh, um, I contacted him a couple, you know, when I could see this, this coming down, you know, like in 2008 or something, I talked to him about who could we get um, that might help us. Yeah, actually, um, he, I mean, he's, 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 he told me you're not, you're not going to find anybody. Um, or, um, but what he did say that was, I'd, I'd already figured this out um, in my life. Um, what Norm said was, find your issue that you think is important and hang on to it. Never let go of it and uh, fight that issue. And that's, that's what we do. Uh, in terms of what's surprising about the Navy is uh, I'm surprised at the extremes that they'll go through um, to have control. They want complete control over information, um, the last federal judges for gag orders. Um, what I found out for Port, in Port Townsend is this, um, and I mean you can see why they're like this. Uh, you have the the ammunition depot at Port Townsend, and across Port Townsend Bay is Port Townsend, and so the worst case scenario at the ammunition depot, and actually the ammunition depot is safer than the than banger, and the explosives are less, and they're not as volatile, even though it's an ammunition depot. The, at Indian Island, they have a maximum of three million pounds of explosives versus 3.7 at Banger. But in the worst case scenario would be a ship would catch fire at the pier, at the ammunition pier, and if that happens, they take their, their worst case scenario response is to take it out into the middle of Port Townsend Bay and try and sink it before it blows up. Of course, if they don't succeed in sinking it before it blows up, and it actually does blow up, they've jeopardized the city. They've just taken it halfway across the bay towards them. And so that came out of the lawsuit, the, the uh, one that went to the Supreme Court. And so you can kind of see why they don't want anyone to know that. The other thing that came out of it is they increased the amount of explosives from 2.25 million to 3 million, and they were never supposed to do that. And it says in the, the 80s EIS that they weren't supposed to do that. Um, and there was another thing, too. Uh, the, one of the, the commander of the ammunition depot said, um, he said that they did a building damage calculation for surrounding buildings around the base uh, to ensure that everyone was safe. And it turns out he was completely false. There was no such thing. There was, and they finally admitted it. There, there isn't anything like that. He did say that if there's an accident at the base, it will be like a pretty bad storm hitting the city, is the way he put it. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Tell us about 
we ought to be doing? Well, you should do what you're doing now, I think. I mean, people have no idea how much, I mean, uh, what is it, Larry Whitner said, I think, came through here, he comes through here once in a while, a, a writer, and he said, if you, have, if you knew how effective you were, you'd be on the street every day. And, and I think it's true. I mean, and I guess that's the flip side of this, right, uh, where I say public opinion is more important than public safety. Well, we have to make sure to inform the public what is going on. And then they'll start addressing safety issues. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful for the group of people I work with, Lake Forest Park for Peace. Um, I don't feel like I could exist without Ground Zero, um, without people who support me and I know we're there if I need the help. So if you're visualing or if you're writing letters or anything like that, I, it's, it's super critical. I mean, here we are. I mean, we're at the end here. I mean, we've been fighting nuclear weapons issues for years. And here we're finally there. We're at the finish line. I mean, people are looking at ending this stuff and we gotta keep going. We, people need to keep going now is more important than ever, I think. Um, I think what we're gonna see, we're gonna see big cuts. So we're gonna see a third of the nuclear warheads cut soon. Um, um, and we just need to keep pushing for that and pushing, you know, they, I think, you know, where the New START Treaty is, what are 1,550 warheads uh, is what they're going to cut down to, and they're saying likely will be cut down to 1,000 to 1,100 warheads. But I mean, there's a lot of people that are saying 500 are, is plenty. And uh, we'd be saving, it'd be a lot safer for us, of course, and, but the money involved um, and the dangers and just the immor immorality so I, that's, I mean, I just, I mean, that's why I came here, because I really respect you guys, and I know what you've been doing, and I'm really grateful, and I just think you should keep doing it.